Today, you are going to meet the person who actually runs our firm, Acuity. We're going to talk about how roles within accounting firms change, not just as a firm scales, but also as individual team members' lives don't change. We're going to discuss the biggest operational challenges a firm has when you go over 100 team members. We'll get into how to wrangle in a couple of out-of-control founders, otherwise known as managing Kenji and Matthew. And to wrap it up, parenting advice for prom weekends. All that here on Drink While You Think, the weekly happy hour conversation between a couple of guys who are building their accounting firm in really weird ways. I'm your host, Kenji. My co-host, Matthew, is actually off in St. Lucia. So instead of Matthew telling you about our sponsor, I will do that. And we do have a new sponsor today. Today's show is being sponsored by Castle Island Brewery from South Boston. Thanks to our friends at Growth Lab Finance as a Service. Dan and Steven at Growth Lab love sharing ideas about how we as an industry can collectively help the accounting profession grow and be more agile. Dan, Stephen, you guys are awesome to actually have. We have a sponsor, and this is a client of theirs at Growth Lab, Castle Island. It's what I'll be drinking today. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, super pumped that you guys sent us beer. Super, very, very nice of you. Check out Growth Lab Finances and Service. I really do believe that they are doing some of the most unique work in the accounting space by bringing uh, productized finance to small businesses. So definitely check them out. Okay, most importantly, Lisa's here. Lisa. Hello, our hello. Here's C- our COO is amazing. All right, Lisa, welcome. Tell everyone who you are, what you do, and most importantly, what you're drinking today. Yeah, so I'm Lisa Gilreath. I'm Chief Operating Officer at Acuity, um, and I get to manage all of our delivery services as well as Matthew and Kenji. So <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun. And today I am drinking Prometheus. Ooh by Three Taverns Craft Brewery in Decatur. Ooh, I love Three Taverns. Three Taverns is awesome. Have you been there before? I haven't. I haven't. I totally picked based on the can. This is how I picked for March Madness as well. (laughs) Okay, we'll see how that's working out, you know? So I like that. I like it. Very cool can. Okay. Um, All right. And like I mentioned, I am drinking the Castle Island Brewing Keeper. This is who our sponsor today is Castle Island Brewing. Check them out. They're in South Boston. This is a six and a half percent IPA. I'm very, very excited about this. Um, Dan, Stephen, you guys, thanks for sending this. I'm being fancy putting it in the mug. Matthew would laugh. I'm going to laugh at you too. I know. What a waste of a dish. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Cheers, Lisa. Cheers to you. Thanks for coming on. Mm. Mmm. Mmm. This could get me in trouble. Oh, yeah? Mm. Uh, that's okay. Then we may have to do the extended edition and go for more of these. Yeah, this is tasty. Oh, we're going to be we're gonna be doing all right today. So, so this okay. is a sour. Oh, it's a sour. Are you in the mm. sours? I love sours. Oh. Yeah. Pomegranate that's... and blueberry sour. Oh, boy. See, so there's I... antioxidants in there. <laughs> I, you know what? We're being healthy. I knew you'd find a way to make this healthy. And I feel like... That's just a better version of a seltzer. Like try a sour, you know, for people. Right, who there's seltzers. flavor. Yeah, get, get something real in there. So, ooh, I like that. Good call there. All right, let's get into it. Um, I, you know, you definitely, Lisa, are playing the most critical role. I am not kidding, in our firm as our COO. And we're going to get into some of the nuts and bolts of uh, what that entails a little bit later. But um, can you start... Uh, with how your role as an accounting professional has changed, just based on the different stages of life you've been in. You've talked about this before as being kind of a mom, a caregiver, and a spouse, and just how you know your own personal life is like has has led to kind of a different journey, I think, in the profession. And how, I guess, based on that, how you how that's impacted maybe some of the teams that you've helped build at Acuity. Yeah, I mean, I think I started my career very early with a public health care company. And at that time, it was um, very intense, very structured in terms of high deadlines, lots of overtime. 
Um, and it had a burnout cycle, right? That happened really quickly, similar to public accounting. And so I left that corporate world and made a shift into consulting, which allowed me to kind of travel and work with smaller businesses, that kind of thing, which was a nice change from public, but ultimately still a lot of overtime. I was a road warrior. My husband was a road warrior. We met in airports on occasion. <laughs> um, so in 2000, we had the opportunity to relocate to Atlanta and I moved, we moved to Atlanta. I was pregnant at the time and it was really kind of a turning point in how I thought about my career because I had to leave my consulting position. Um, and I was in Atlanta by myself. We didn't have any family over here to support me or anything like that with a newborn baby. And so I had to make a decision very early on about work-life balance. And it was going to be either I could find it or I couldn't. And if I couldn't find it, I just wasn't gonna be able to work because frankly, at that time being new to Atlanta, I was so afraid of being stuck on the interstates with a baby. I could not even fathom you know, <laughs> what that looked like. But you know, that kind of changed my mindset about how I worked and how I approached my career. And so, you know, through that process, I worked with several small startups um, here in Atlanta and got introduced to Acuity and started as a part-time controller way back then. And from there, um, I was able to balance my family as a part-time controller and continued to grow. And as my seasons of life changed, my kids got older, I was able to take on bigger clients, more responsibility within the firm. And now my kids are so close to being all grown and out that <laughs> here I am. They are almost there. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I love that. I think when you, whenever you have described that, um, to me, it represents just, again, such a great way to show that there is a path for really anybody. Because I think historically, it has been in, in many pockets still, I think the profession, it's so high burnout. It is so high amount of hours. It's just crazy. And so um, hearing your story about how you were able to, I think, I won't say being a pioneer in this space, but you were early. I don't think a lot of people were really being able to find ways to juggle and not step off the track of the profession, but you did. And I guess, have you felt like that's influenced the way that we've or that you've built teams at Acuity or that you've helped kind of staff things up? What's been your thought about your, the way that it happened to you? And should we look for more team members like that at Acuity? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's parts to that to recognize, right? There were certain points in my career where I had to put a pin in it and be happy with the position that I held at that point in time because I was not willing to do what was required to go to the next level. And so I, I very much acknowledge that, that there were pauses in my career as a part of that. But I do think one of the things that makes um, me happiest at Acuity is being able to offer positions to people that are in that same position as I was, right? They are extremely talented professionals who have got great experience and just need balance. They need structure that allows them to work and do challenging work that they, when they want to do challenging work and still leave and balance family obligations. And so to me, like, I love it when we're able to hire people and give them opportunities to continue to build their skills without feeling like they have to completely unplug from the profession. Yeah. I think that was something that we we found when we started seeing successes of people just like you and, and at Acuity was I think that we became aware of this other market out there of like this almost like this hidden market of talent of people who weren't really showing up on you know probably employment rates and things like that because they were they'd chosen to opt out of to your point they kind of put a pin in it but putting a pin in it historically meant like you just had you couldn't work at all like it just was like a, it was a black or white you were in or out so I think that was really revealing when we saw the success of you and some others were like oh wait a minute there's there's probably some more people out here like this I think that was very helpful in seeing that so um all right well let's switch gears a little bit uh to I think as I think about other firm owners and we've been trying to do that lately about okay what other firm owners who a lot of them do tune into this, what do they probably want to know about Acuity? And I think if now that people know you, I'm a little worried that your inbox is going to get slammed because they're like, oh, wait a minute. Lisa is the one who really knows how everything works in Acuity, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What would you say that 
I mean, we're probably six or seven times the size bigger um, than when you started. We're you know over a hundred people, hundred about one hundred and fifty now or so, a little more. Um, I don't know. Just I guess be we'll be open and honest about what are the biggest operational issues I think that firm owners should expect when they start scaling at that. Like, okay, we're going over fifty, getting toward 100, 150. Like, what are what are you dealing with right now? That's like, oh my gosh, this is this is the stuff that people should look out for. Yeah, I mean, I think probably the biggest thing that we're experiencing right now is that it's it's tough to turn the ship, right? When you <laughs> yeah. are smaller and you have ten or twelve people to communicate to, and you know, fifty or less clients, making a shift in a technology platform or methodology or a strategy um, can be done in a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like you can just buckle down and convert people and move people and and that kind of thing. Um, when you're at our scale of 145 people and 600 clients, nothing gets done in a weekend. It is a <laughs> monumental shift in terms of getting all of the bodies to march in the right direction and do all of the things. Um, and so I think that's something that we're still learning how to do effectively and yeah. how to how we do it efficiently. But it's probably the biggest thing when we think about scaling and growing oh, yeah. is that it's just a lot harder to move <laughs> the ship. You made me think about, um, I don't know if you remember this, uh, but and it, it really didn't impact you at the time, but I did exactly that. There was some one weekend when I found a different CRM tool uh, as back when we had as close back in the day. And I'm like, I literally went and switched from Infusionsoft to close in like one weekend. I was like, I just got all excited about this, this cool system. And it was disruptive for sure, but also it actually, it worked. It wasn't that big of a deal. Like we flipped it over and I had to kind of talk to some of the sales team members, like on Monday, I'm like, Hey, we made a change and here's what we did. But you're right. We used to do those things all the time, like on a whim, we'd come back from a conference or we'd come back from somewhere like, Oh, got a wild, got a wild hair and just decided to change things around, which today that's just a, it's just no way that can happen. Um, yeah. And I think as we've continued to grow and we've, we've had different systems in play, we're now getting more and more integrated. Yeah. So a slight shift can disrupt the ecosystem, you know, months down the road. Um, and so it's just trying to think about where the ripples go when you throw the, the rock in the water. <laughs> Oh yes, all the ripples that just like, keep going and going. They seem like they magnify, and yeah, it's um, it, it's crazy. What what are some other areas you think too that I mean I think of right now? I know we've got a number of initiatives. In fact, someone asked me recently, like, "What's your 2022 look like?" And I was like, you know, "I'm really excited about it." But honestly, externally, it's going to look boring to people. But like internally, I feel like we're working on a million things, like to try to get things operational. What what are some other areas you think of that are like? kind of, I won't say burning fires for acuity, but things that are like, wow, that are on your plate that are, that are big, big, that maybe a, a smaller firm of 10, 20 probably hasn't considered. Um, I think just our staffing engine in general, like trying to hire people as fast as we're hiring people and getting them integrated. Um, you know, training takes time. And when you hire one person a quarter, it's very <laughs> it's just again it goes back to you have the time to mentor those people you have the time to be with them um when you're hiring six seven a month you know you need a structure in place to come around those people and train them and mentor them and buddy them and that's i think where we're still trying to figure out what's the best combination of um self-paced training and right. high touch training and how that blends with a flexible schedule that we're right. offering. Right. Um, there's some give and take there in terms of when you offer flexible work environments, like we do, you don't necessarily have people there eight hours a day on right. the same schedule. And so there, there are different things that you have to think through on planning and scheduling. And do, do you remember when um, this probably goes back to even when you started with us, when I heard the word onboarding, I only thought of it in terms of like client onboarding, like new client onboarding. I'm like, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I always just think about, we just used to hire people and like, hey, to your point, you'd buddy them up with somebody else. Like, oh yeah, you're a controller. So why don't you go hang with this controller? And like, that was kind of it. Oh, and let's make sure we give you a laptop. 
but that was like it. And now I found that we have to distinguish so much when we're talking about onboarding. So we talk about onboarding all the time because we're onboarding clients and we're onboarding employees. And like, that is I, both of those uh, components of onboarding are probably one of the things that probably restrict us the most from growth. Like they're probably one of the toughest areas to solve. And I just was always like, oh, how do you bring on clients faster? But we've got just the same issue now with employees. Well, and I think what's really interesting, um, of course, I think this comes out after the upcoming meetings, but um, <laughs> so when I think about acuity in 2017, 18, that kind of thing, um, the majority of our employees had been there for a lot of years, right? Three, True. four years yeah. were probably the average tenure at that point in time. Yeah. Um, currently, 70% of our employees have been with Acuity less than three years. Oh my gosh. So just that. that difference in terms of culture of, <laughs> you know, the tenured people that have learned all the bad habits that we potentially have being a small <laughs> company and winging it, right? Yep. And then we have this group of individuals who are trying to do the right thing. You know, I strongly believe everybody's just trying to do their best work, right? Nobody comes to work thinking they're going to do a terrible job. Um, and so they're like, what the heck? Um, so there's just this melding that has to happen as we kind of, for lack of a better word, like we're birthing a new organization here. Like yeah. we're at that point where we're reinventing and we're scaling and we will come out of this on the other side looking very different than 2018 acuity did just yeah. by the nature of volume. Yeah. I, you're hundred percent correct there. I think we've seen that we talked a lot about this with our, some of our acquisitions of where it's not provided opportunity for new people to step in and kind of take a look around and go, Oh my gosh, the scale here is just so different. Right. And we forget about that sometimes. Um, but I I'm reminded when we think externally of acquisitions coming in, or we look for uh, at other firms, just for, hey, how are you doing things that there's not that many that have been down this path before. So it does to us feel very new. And we were trying to look for, well, how did so-and-so do it when they started approaching 200 people where you're getting near a thousand clients? Um, there are not that many there. And so it does feel very much like this. And again, we've given you the toughest task of we're kind of creating this or birthing this new organization. And we're like, all right, Lisa, you're, you're going to be the the caregiver, the babysitter, the, the teacher, the all these things of something that we're not even exactly sure how it's going to look at the end of the day. So it's a it's a funky. I mean, it's fun. We what's yeah, we Matthew, don't want an ugly baby. We, we don't want an ugly baby. Nobody wants an <laughs> ugly baby. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh and, and again, Matthew and I would have probably created an ugly baby. Like, thankfully, Lisa's here to pretty things up for us a, a bit. Um, but, yeah, but I will what... <laughs> say, like, one of the other things that sticks out to me when we think about where we are now, and you're talking about other firms, I know you're very connected into that accountant community and, and listening to our firm partners and friends and getting feedback of what they're seeing in the industry and, and that um, I've had to shift my focus outside to larger organizations mm -hmm. to try to figure out how we solve some of these problems. Because like you've mentioned before, we don't necessarily have people their same size where we can compare what do you do when right. you have this many kind of things so right. I tend to listen more on um, operations and HR side outside of the industry to try to pick up some things that will help us at scale I think that's really wise because if you just ask around okay how many firms are using like Salesforce right very few in our space I mean and, and we use it as a critical system. So already we're like, that's kind of our system of record for most things. And we're, there's hardly anybody else in the space using a big system like that. So we have to look elsewhere. I think the value has been making sure that we stay fresh and innovative or on top of what's coming. The smaller firms are really good about that because they, to your point earlier, they can pivot, they can be quick and nimble and try things. So it certainly is, um, is is interesting trying to look for those who've gone before us because 
there's sometimes I, I don't know about you, but I don't feel incredibly creative. Sometimes I'm like, I need to see a concrete example of how it was done before. Then when I see that, we're like, okay, cool. Now we can kind of build something based on what someone else has done. So um, anyway, but well, let's, okay, let's keep going here on to, um, I think the role that you've been playing for a long time, you've always been in the operations role, but one of the ones that you've been known for uh, for quite some time at Acuity is, is being this, uh, whether it's maybe the interpreter of Matthew and Kenji, or I think a lot of people have probably come to you um, over the years and go, how do you deal with both Matthew and Kenji? And I guess, um, uh, you know, this is, this one's probably a good question to answer for, again, for the thousandth time that an Acuity team member has asked this question, because as we have grown and scaled, he and I don't get a chance to be with people all the time. And so there's probably a lot, I mean, you've probably spent a ton of time like dealing, dealing with the two of us. So how do you, how, how would you advise like, what do you say to employees when you're like, okay, how do I deal with the two of them? Um, how do I advise employees? Um, with my best words. Um, Come on, this is a Friday. We're having drinks. Use the yeah, no, words. I mean, I think um, at the end of the day, you two are no different than really working with anybody else is that you have to understand um the point where all your opinions start from, right? Hmm. So like when I think about Matthew um, in particular, especially when he's thinking about a process or how we do something in the firm related to accounting, it's always from the audit perspective, right? And that auditor perspective drives you back to as long as the balance sheet is right, <laughs> the rest of it doesn't <laughs> matter, <laughs> True. <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. From that side of things. When I think about your perspective, you tend to focus more on the people and the feelings and that kind of yep, thing. Yep. And so having that perspective <laughs> in working with both of you, it's easy to sometimes say, OK, I hear what you're saying, Matthew. And we're in the same room with Kenji, who is saying this and these don't these don't match. So <laughs> we've done that several times, but um Quite a few times. Quite. I, a I'm few interpreter. Times. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're definitely have been an interpreter for us for a long time, and I do think, I, I think back to me the comical times of you sat there trying to uh, interpret or just mediate between the two of us, and I'm thinking, man, how in the world does she put up with this? Because I think there's been a lot, a lot of that. Where I always tell people that like our values, yours, mine, Matthews. Patty, Scott, really every acuity are the same. We have so the, the values really hold true. Um, and even our, our goals, our strategies are, we're all in agreement on those. How we all get there is a very, is different. And that's typically where the, the friction comes in or where someone needs to kind of mediate and say, no, no, remember we're, what Kenji said, he still wants to go the same direction there, but he's got to do it through his intuition and gut and feelings and make sure the people are right. Matthew's got to do his through um, some complex routine that he's kind of created with, that has a side deal on it that is, you know, five steps ahead of everybody else, you know, and, and, and then you're in the middle trying to say, I'm just trying to glue this damn thing together to get it actually into something that we can no longer theorize about because I think that's a thing that he and I like doing is like coming up with all these ideas and let's go and then we usually have to really look at you and go oh wait a minute time out is this like even feasible like does this work and you for us been that person who looks at us and says either no that does not work or yes it does or we could get it there but like you know everything from acquisitions because you are always our final point on things on big things like Sounds good in theory. We like it, but like Lisa, is this going to work or not? And you're the one who can usually see the intersection of my weird ideas and Matthew's. And like, is this actually going to work? Yeah, and I think recognizing that you guys verbalize a lot way in advance mm -hmm. of when it's actually going to happen. <laughs> like that helps me interpret, right? Because. Mm -hmm. Some of the things, like we've had this conversation of like, you can't say that right now. You're going to freak people out. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my God, you're <laughs> if right. you say that, right? Like, um, 
so I think it's probably just understanding when you guys are brainstorming and spinning and thinking and dreaming and that kind of thing versus this is real and we're ready to move forward and do something that's a little bit more tactical. And we tend to fly by the seat of our pants a little bit, right? So yeah. that's part yeah. of the fun of acuity. Like if we were all buttoned up and it'd be boring and um, we, we would not be very happy, but um, being able to say, hey, let's try something new. And if it's a mistake, it's a mistake. And we call it a mistake. And then we course correct and move on. Yeah, but you're, I hadn't thought of that, that before, but you're, you're absolutely right. I can think of how many times you've counseled us in meetings or in times together of like, hey, I don't think you guys can say that yet, right? Where, and you're right, we tend to just be very transparent. Exactly what we're feeling or thinking is going to come out. And I think there are times that we as founders think that like, isn't that great? Like everyone's going to love this transparency. And there's not that people don't like transparency, but yeah, if you're talking about a strategy that's years down the road or even months down the road that may impact someone in some unknown way, like that actually can freak people out. Like that can make them nervous. And so we miss that one all the time. And so that's a great place where you've been like, hey, that's great and all. That's a longer term strategy. That's probably not a communication point. We have to think about who's in the room because if we haven't flushed out how that's going to actually work and impact that person's day to day life, we're actually creating more. They're just going to go home and stress about that and their wheels are going to spin about it, right? So Right, and, and that's part of, of just kind of understanding our employee population, right? We're hiring accountants. They are type A planners. They need process. They need procedure. They need to know what's coming next so they can plan for it. They need to have rules. And so if you don't have those things laid out, it create stress, yeah. right? If you yeah. have a better explanation and you have it laid out, then there's less stress. But, you know, if we were a team full of marketing execs, then we'd probably just go with it, right? Because marketing <laughs> and salespeople are all about feelings. They're like, oh yes, let's go run, you know, charge up the hill without a plan. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, it would just be different. It would be very different. It'd be very different. Um, all right. Well, let's, um, Let's shift it to our fun topic uh, and land this here. But I think if if serves me correctly, is it also prom weekend for you this weekend? Or is that coming it up? Is in a not, it is not prom weekend for us this weekend. We're at the end of April. We've had oh. the prom move three times now. What? Um, so yeah, fingers crossed it all works out. COVID life, right? Venues change. They get moved around, yeah, new protocols. Yeah. All those things. Well, I was thinking about this topic because we, we've been talking about it. Many of our team meetings together um, involve talking about what's happening at our homes because we happen to have kids at about the same stage of life. It is prom weekend for us here this weekend. So it's here. Nice. I know you guys have been prepping for it. So um, give, okay. You mentioned this week uh, the prom dress shopping that got completed for you this past week. Is that right? For that is true. Uh, it was a okay. tear free experience. I'm, I'm marking that down in the book. <laughs> tear free experience. So is that your threshold for when things are going fine? If there's no tears, no tears. Yes. Okay. That, that's probably, I think, good advice or counsel to other parents who are like, my kids are not at that age yet, but like, if you can actually get through these dramatic milestones like a prom or a homecoming or whatever it might be and there's not tears that's a win that's an absolute win yeah i mean the reality is i have a high school senior who's preparing for all sorts of life changes like march 18th we are 45 school days till graduation like all sorts of big decisions yeah and there's a lot of emotion going on here a lot. <laughs> okay. So we're hearing, be ready for the emotion. Um, here's, I'll throw this in there too. I'm, I'm, um, uh, I don't, there's always the possibility of tears. You and I both have daughters. I guess it could be any kid, sons, whatever, but currently our, our prom bound children are, are both our daughters. Mine has this weekend and yeah, if there's crying, I'm sure things have gone horribly wrong. Um, with mine, I'm also saying that there's no crying and nobody gets arrested. I'm, I, I, 
<laughs> I'm going to add that as also one of my criteria to kind of put in there that's going to put some boundaries on what success looks like for prom weekend. Um, so you maybe give me some thoughts on this. We are trying to figure out, the question has been raised here of, but what about the post-prom parties that we want to go to? Yeah. Does that come up for you yet? Um, we did have some preliminary testing the waters as to what that would look like. Um, well, okay. I think here. prom has gotten crazy. Like, yeah. Like lake houses being rented. Oh like, my gosh. What is that about? Yeah. That, that's a recipe for disaster. And I just kind of want to be like, what parent thought that was a good idea to put a bunch of teenagers in a lake house this, this sounds like a like a like a bad like 80s movie or something right that like it but does. yeah like that, we, we're trained about this yeah when, when we were that when you and i were that age it was, i was kind of cool but now that we're parents like what in the world so we've got here's where we're at i think um my daughter is going with a group of kids has a date with a group of kids luckily in the group are some of our best friends here in the neighborhood and we think that either at one point we were going to host the post-prom party. I think they're going to host um, in their basement, but we've decided as parents, we're all going to like go over there and kind of collectively supervise, which. Um, that didn't go over well. No, that's my biggest concern. Lisa is this is tomorrow <laughs> night. I feel like I'm going to need to go to bed like here in like an hour or two. So I can be well rested. Cause I don't want to stay up till midnight 1 a.m supervising um a bunch of juniors and seniors in high school i just feel like that's going to cause more stress than i need but that's that's the current state of affairs right now is i think we're going to be down the street supervising uh the, the post-prom party um i think you and, should be reconfiguring your ring doorbells <laughs> i was gonna i was gonna ask what we need to do yeah um that might be a good idea. I do have, I do have somewhere the, the remote ring camera. Maybe we just need to take that and go hide that somewhere just to kind of keep, you know, is that an invasion of privacy? I feel like when it's in your own kids, it's like, no, that's just smart parenting. I don't know. We're still minors. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're still minors. Still so. minors. It's still, yeah, it's still, um, they're still minors. I think I think that that probably works then. I think maybe the ring camera, and that might be, um, you know, that would probably be something to where I'm sure people would say, I, can I just watch the ring camera video from your all your kids doing a post-prom party in the basement of your house? Um, that would be a very entertaining and, and scary moment for me, but we'll have to see. That may be the, that may be the right plan. Whatever yeah. I figure out, well, Lisa, I'll, I'll be sure to share with you as you guys get ready for from. Definitely. Well, I'm trying to keep an open mind because, um, and I'm sure you're experiencing a little bit of the same thing. Like this is the only high school thing that she has really gotten to experience because all the rest of it has been canceled. That's true. Um, That's true. so she's had a weird high school experience in general. Yeah. So I'm trying to be like open-minded and, but there's limits. That's true. You're, you're like, you know what? I hate that you've missed out on so much, but then again, uh, the fact that it was harder to probably get into trouble during this time, eh, we don't mind that so much. So yeah. Well, and all kids are different. So I, I just, um, yeah, I'm hoping that uh, it all goes smoothly. I'm hoping that I don't need to move up to something more uh, heavy in alcohol tomorrow night as we're monitoring, but well, let's uh, land this thing and do some voting on beer. I'm going to do mine first. I've already pulled up from our wonderful sponsor, Castle Island Brewing Company in South Boston. Again, thanks, Growth Lab crew. Uh, this was very, very solid. And this, I would normally think about this being like a, a New England-based IPA, um, like a hazy, but this is a great classic IPA. I love this. This is an all day long drinkable. This is for me going to get a nice solid four, four, two, five for a good, I, great IPA. I was very happy with that. Um, Lisa, remind me, what is this cool 
beer. What's it called again? Um, Prometheus. Prometheus. By Three Taverns Craft Brewery oh, in Decatur, Georgia. Well, it's hard to find names that are so Prometheus. Oh. And that's from the Three Taverns. There it is. Sorry, Matthew, this is where Matthew loves me trying to type things in. Yes, three tab. There it is. Oh, yeah, there's the cool looking. Yeah. Available uh, at your local fresh market. No, oh, yeah, there it is. Look at that cool. That is a super cool can. I very, very much, cool I can. very much like it. All right. What do you want to give it on a scale of one to five or zero to five? Um, this is actually very good. I oh, yeah. Rate, yes. I would rate this really high, probably a 4.5 or a five. Like I would, Whoa. This, this could be a go-to for me if I would ever find it. You said a 4.5 or a five. How about I give it a 4.75 right there now? There you go. That's a good salad. Oh, that's awesome. Um, nice, nice, nice. Check out the Prometheus. Love the fact that it came from a, the good old Three Taverns Brewery. Uh, we appreciate everyone checking things out. I will say, don't totally bomb Lisa's email inbox, but truly, if you want to understand how things run at Acuity, Lisa is the person to ask. Uh, we're thankful again to our sponsors um, who came in here uh, with Castle Island. I'll share a cool picture. They also sent along with this, Lisa, you would love it. A Castle Island looks like a little beer can. It's actually a squeeze toy for dogs. And Ruthie's oh, nice. been playing with it. So I'll, I'll post a picture of that up in the show notes. Thanks, too. But thanks, Lisa, for coming on. And certainly thanks Anytime. for all you're doing for us at Acuity. But cheers, everyone. Please subscribe. And we'll see you next cheers. time on Drink What You Think. See you later.